Are you ready? Stand by. This podcast is brought to you by Breda USA, Italian shotguns that are the best in the world. And this is a shotgun tech tip from Team Breda. Hey, this is Dave Hartman from The Three Gun Show, and I'm with Tina martin Nims from Team Breda, and we are going to learn about choke selection. So before you go out to the match, you want to make sure that you have an understanding of how um, what your chokes are patterned at. So what I like to do is I take, I have my three main chokes that I usually use, which is a spreader, an IC, an approved concylinder, or, and a mod. And I set my targets out at 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30. And it's just like a knockover steel and a flipper. And I test to see what those cho- how they perform at those distances with the ammo that I typically use. And so when I go out onto a stage, I already know that at, say, 35 yards, I can use my mod choke and knock it out. And I'll be all right, ready to go. Awesome. All right. Well, that's your tech tip from Tina Martin-Nims of Team Breda. Check out Breda's B12i three-gun ready inertia-driven shotgun at BredaUSA.com. That's B-R-E-D-A. Hey there, and welcome to the Three Gun Show. I'm your host, Dave Hartman. If you're new here, our regular Wednesday show is a deep dive into the mindset, training, and techniques of the best practical shooters in the world. What you're listening to now is a match recon podcast where we have a shooter run down a set criteria and give you the tools needed to excel when shooting the match that we're covering. I do a lot of these recons myself, and uh, if I didn't shoot the match, I interview one of the amazing people in our community that did. This is the replay of the recon podcast that supporters of the Three Gun Show on Patreon got to listen to real time. Patreon is a subscription-based service that allows you, the listener, to support creators like myself on a monthly basis. I can't thank the patrons enough for their support of The Three Gun Show, which helps me to continue bringing regular, high-quality content to you. If you dig the work that I'm doing on the podcast, on YouTube, on Instagram, etc., consider supporting the show with a few bucks each week at patreon.com slash three gun show. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Show notes, including a written breakdown of all the recon criteria, can be found at 3gunshow.com. Just search for the name of this match. Now enjoy this match recon, and I'll see you on the range. Welcome to the 3 Gun Show, brought to you by Armalite. I'm your host, Dave Hartman, and this is a special match recon podcast with a special field correspondent, Diana Muller. Di, how are you? A field correspondent. I yeah. love it. <laughs> Good to be here. This this is a uh, this is kind of a throwback. Like the first time we uh, we ever chatted was on over the Skype, and uh, and here we are again two years later. Has it been two years? Yeah, it's like year and three quarter ish. Wow. Well, congratulations on uh, the success of your show. <laughs> Thanks. We're keeping her floating here. We're having a good time. Well. You know, since the uh, the last time we've we've talked, I've been shooting a ton of matches, and one of the uh, the cool things that I've been able to do is create like this uh, this template of criteria that the the listeners are interested in, based on listener feedback of what they look for when they go and shoot a match, and that's what the match recon is all about. And I actually shot the match that we're going to talk about today, but I shot with the staff, and it's a unique match, and I felt like I I needed a unique perspective, and that's that's why I invited you to join me here. Well, I think that's a great idea um, to do the recon things and, and let people make a decision uh, based on somebody who's been there, uh, what their thoughts and were about the match. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And the, uh, the, you know, the, the amount of match dollars and time are finite, right? So we have to be smart about when we, where we spend our, our money and our time. So this, uh, this allows people to make a little bit of educated decisions based on the type of match that they like to see and, and, uh, get your perspective as well so if uh you know if you if you agree with with die on a lot of topics you're going to agree with her on these on this match and uh we'll figure it out here as we go so sure die what match do we shoot well we just got back from the 2017 brown owls a girl and a gun fall fest presented by red stitch 
It was October 3rd through 6th at Rock Castle Shooting Center, one of my favorites. Yep, yep. It was a total time, which was not my favorite. Uh, they used a proprietary rule uh, rule book, which was just kind of a, you know, it was their own. Right, it's a girl uh, and a gun choosing, rule set. Picking and, pick, picking and choosing what they wanted. Um, they used practice score, which worked out really well. The schedule was kind of a modified uh, on-off deal. Basically, if you've been to Rock Castle, you know that it's uh, advantageous for match directors to keep people in Thunder Valley or keep people in the bays uh, or on that side. It's just travel time is so uh, precious. Uh, the match fee was $250. They had 125-ish shooters. I don't know their exact total. Uh, the division winners were Ashley Ruark in Tack Ops, Linda Horn in Irons, Katrina Reed in Open. Oh, very cool. So, and I got, I got second. <laughs> <laughs> you got second in Tack? I did. <laughs> very nice. Well done. Just for your listeners out there, I'm sure they were wondering. No, I, I was actually wondering. So, <laughs> And I was there. Yeah. What were you doing that you weren't paying attention, Dave? Well, you know, I paid a lot less attention to the scores because I wasn't actually shooting for score. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, and well, I, and, I, and that might take us to something else about the match is that um, I would love to hear your feedback as well uh, because yours is going to be different than mine. But sure. I really feel like the energy uh, at this match is just, just you can feel it, mm -hmm. and. You know, these ladies are the ranger proof gentleman that came up and was talking about it. He was saying the same thing. He said that you guys are, you know, there's, they really uh, are having a great time and you can feel it. Yes. And, and the, there's less pretense. He was kind of talking about guys and how they kind of <laughs> puff their, uh, puff their chests up. And, and, sh and he's just like, these guys just don't care. You know, the girls come here and they don't care. They just want to have a good time and be safe and, and shoot guns. And that's exactly kind of how I felt about it. What did you think? You know, I thought it was really cool. So I, I get to shoot and because of the podcast, I get to associate with like, a all the top 20 guys and you know, the vast majority of them take it very seriously um, there's a small minority that don't get, don't take it too seriously, but do end up doing pretty well. And I find right. that a, a lot of guys like just put like a ton of pressure on themselves to where like they can't even enjoy the experience for what it is of like, you know, it's a vacation. There's, there's a vacation associated with it. You're not in your daily life. You're not in your engineer job, your cubicle job. And, uh, you're going out and, you know, competing. But then, uh, I think that robs some people from the joy of, of it and, you know, having fun. So in yeah. this match, like you said, the energy was definitely palpable there. You, <laughs> you see, uh, you know, ladies cheering for each other when, you know, they hit a hard shot or something that they were, you know, concerned about doing, or I can't hit that, uh, those pistol targets when they clean the pistol plates, then, uh, you, you know, they're away. all cheering for each other. So it's, uh, yeah, actually I had to tell my girls in my squad, cause you know, they'll, they'll yell while you're in, in, the stage. Yeah. And I said, Hey, you can't do that. I, I I'm double muffed and I feel like the, that I'm doing something wrong or dangerous. So I'm pausing. <laughs> I was like, you can't yell until it's done. So <laughs> they, they all laughed and they're like, fine. And then at the end they, they blow up, but yeah, you're right. It's definitely like that. And one of the other things that I really appreciate, um, about a girl and a gun and their admin, this is the only, only the second year they've done this. Mm hmm and they do such a tremendous job of providing an experience for the women. And uh, they set up several pros come in early and, and have clinics. Yeah. So I did, I did two uh, three-hour clinics on Wednesday. And then I did a, a stage strategy walkthrough on uh, Thursday. But, you know, if you're going to go, uh, I, I, I mean, I felt like the girls – uh, got a lot out of the classes and they said they did. Mm -hmm. Um, even though, even though I've seen some of them at three gun matches and one, you know, a couple of them showed up to rifle one on one and I was looking at them going, girls, <laughs> why are you here? But it, even at the end of that, they said that, you know, they, 
uh, appreciate it and learn something. And, you know, what's kind of nice about small groups like that is that you can tailor classes to make sure everybody gets something out of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, so there was a, like a rifle class, rifle one-on-one, a pistol class, a shotgun class. And I believe there was like a long range class. Yes. And, and then walkthroughs with pros, any other shooting up op- or any other opportunities? Well, I did three gun. I did a three gun one in the afternoon. So I did a rifle, all rifle in the morning and then three gun in the afternoon. And we just worked on transitions from gun to gun. Okay. And a little bit of lateral transition, you know, uh, lateral movement and making sure that they don't break the 180, which is pretty much where you're going to get bit as a new shooter Mm -hmm. uh, with moving around with long guns. I got you. Yeah, and the the feedback that I heard from the uh, ladies that did go to the classes were that they were super valuable. So, you know, if this is a, a match you're considering in the future, the uh, the feedback is positive on on those uh, extra opportunities there. Right, and it's kind of funny because uh, w- one of the things that has never happened to me before at a match was like nine o'clock. I want to say it was it was late. I, I was beat. I had been teaching all day. Um, or walking stages all day. And uh, this gal shows up at my trailer and Heather and I are there, Heather, Heather Miller. And we're there and she's like, knock, knock. And I don't even remember what she said, but the bottom line was that she showed up with a pistol. Uh, she had gone to a girl in a gun national conference. Mm-hmm. She had taken a class of uh, sporting clays. That was her entire experience with a shotgun. Oh, wow. And then with she had zero experience with a rifle. So Heather Miller and I are just I felt so bad for this girl. We (laughs) you know, we want her to have a good experience. Yeah, of (laughs) course. She she has no idea that she just jumped headfirst into a tropical storm in the middle of the ocean. (laughs) (laughs) And we tried to keep our wits about us as we're trying to help her understand, you know, basically give her tutorials on how to mount the rifle, how to mount the shotgun, how to load the shotgun, how to do all your gear on your belt. And it was like drinking from the fire hose. Wow. Like the the, night before a match. In the end, I just, you know, we're sitting there looking at her and there's so much more to tell her. And I was like, you know what, if it just gets to be too much, just say, I can't, I don't want to do this anymore. I just want to shoot my pistol on this stage and just shoot your pistol. If I just want to shoot two guns on a stage that requires three, do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you want to just take a break and not shoot a stage, do that. So uh, this woman, her name is Jennifer Cook. Uh, By the end, by the second day, uh, she was on Becky Ackley's squad. And by the second day, Becky reported to me that she was shooting all three guns on three stages that day. Wow. So, uh, yeah. So that was uh, a huge... uh, to see somebody blossom like that, it really moved Becky. And Becky actually uh, won a rifle off the prize table and ends up turning around and giving it to her uh, so she wow. could continue on her uh, her three-gun journey. And she definitely said that, you know, that she sees why people say this is addictive and that she's definitely going to start shooting three-gun and, <laughs> <laughs> and on and on. So... Yeah, that was a success story for sure. And I don't think that you would have seen that um, at any other match. Yeah, how cool is that? You know, you uh, pretty much like hooked her for life now you know, after after that <laughs> yeah. experience. Say goodbye to all your money. Sell your children. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. All right. Well, that, that gives us an, uh, a really clear idea of the uh, the match flavor then, that, that story in, in and of itself. So what were the, uh, what was the terrain like? Well, if you've ever been to Rock Castle, you know that it's um, mostly a natural terrain uh, range, and and they did not use any of the bays. They have access to a handful of bays, and they did not use any of those for the match. They only used those for the side matches. So they had a couple of side matches that the girls could um, take part in. That was awesome, Glock, and um, what was the other one, the Target Company? Uh, gunfighter, gunfighter targets. Gunfighter, thank you. Gunfighter had a, a a side match, so you know that's just something for to fill the time or the downtime and uh, high uh, showcase your product. So mm-hmm. that worked out well. But the the match itself actually took place in natural terrain. Gotcha. 
and the uh the terrain was was varied too like it's it's not all the same so you know you've got thunder valley where you're running up and down uh short hills large hills and then uh, of course there's the the valley portion that's like basically an open grass field and you get to shoot up on on the hills and stuff which is kind of cool yeah and i felt like the match directors did a really nice job of putting out a cross section of all of our skills um you know we were using three guns I think on every stage except the all shotgun stage, but we had slings going on. We were climbing up towers. Uh, this was not an easy, an easy match. And even some of the targets, if I were to have a say, I would, you know, in my feedback, I give them my feedback would be that, Hey, the, the shotgun targets on stage so-and-so they need to be moved in five yards. Yeah. Period. You know, simple, easy things like that. So it wasn't, it uh, it was not an easy match, but it was doable, and I felt like they gave the ladies a real flavor of anything that they're going to run into in another three gun match. Yeah, so so let's uh, let's talk about that. What sort of skills were utilized? You mentioned one there with uh, shotgun. I was actually surprised that um, twice I needed to choke up to a mod, where usually an IC will get me through months of shooting three gun matches. Well, and that's kind of my point on my feedback to match directors. I don't think that this match is um, designed or intended to be the most difficult match that you shoot during mm -hmm. the year. So I'll I'll let them know that the you know some of the targets, whether you know if they're heavy, uh, like the red stitch targets, are kind of difficult to take down. Mm -hmm. You can't set them at the max IC or max light mod. You need to set them in a little bit further. So. Uh, yeah, that like, like I said, this wasn't this wasn't a really give me match for sure. Right. Yeah, and and that's that's kind of uh um I guess that that anytime I, I, I <laughs> die I struggle with how how to uh, say this without sounding like a a misogynist a-hole, but I guess anytime you you throw like ladies only on something, the assumption is that it's going to be simpler. It's going to be easier, but that definitely was not the case with the uh, the stages that were put out at Rock Castle. Well, correct, and um, and and you know, I, I really feel like maybe they should be or could be watered down just a little bit, just because we are targeting a base of shooters that we don't, you know, what do we see at a normal three gun match? Twenty, thirty. 40 at the most women that ever show up to a single um, outlaw three gun match. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're basically tripling the tripling or quadrupling the numbers that we usually see. So obviously we're bringing in some new shooters. So I don't want to chase anybody off any women that thought that, you know, this is too much for me because honestly I would say that it is. But then again, there's Jennifer cook who, who just came in and uh, I think she had enough lifeguards uh, to help her through the match. So I feel, I don't want to turn anybody off from it, but just know that it's not, it's not going to be a, a cakewalk either. There's a lot of moving parts to three gun. Yeah. And I guess uh, when you take gender out of it, you wouldn't really at like an outlaw match where there's 200 people, you wouldn't have like a, a 30 or 40% new shooter ratio. Right. I mean, it's, it's usually a lot smaller than that. Right, right. Three gun matches are really difficult to get into. Um, I always tell my girls and, and, and newbies that if you're listening to this, that uh, brianenos.com under their forum section, there's a multi gun um, announcements, and that's where all of the matches put out their information and their schedule. So uh, you have to you have to start looking at that now for 2018 to kind of pinpoint when those entries open because some of these matches, a lot of these matches fill up in a matter of a minute. And if you don't get, if you're not there, you're not going to get in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very true. All right. So, so, so what other, what other skills were utilized in this? Well, long range that you had uh, targets out to uncomfortable positions uh, one was kind of an inverted prone or off of a rickety barricade out to 310, I think was the longest one. Mm -hmm. And then off of a, um, off of the back of the truck, uh, there's a toolbox in the back of the truck. So it kind of makes it weird, a weird position. Right. And 
and uh, there were anything from 165 long range to uh, I think it was another 310, 320 with a 400 bonus. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was some there was some long range stuff. Now one of the things I don't know if they'll continue this. Uh, my my suggestion is they had basically they scored uh, their paper, which is not normal necessarily. It's not abnormal, but um, it's not normal. But then they put white um, no shoots behind baby <laughs> Ipsic targets. Yeah, and so you I could thought, see them, right? No, these women, the women, <laughs> these new people, or even mediocre people, uh, the penalty of having a mic is going to be enough. You don't have to give them a you know a mic and a no shoot. Uh, the penalties in this match were exorbitant. I've never seen so many penalties. I was proud of myself because I think I was like the lowest penalty. If I win anything, I think I got the lowest penalty deal. I think I had 40 seconds of penalty. Yeah. Yeah, and th this is interesting. You know, a lot of the matches you go to and you see, <laughs> you see like, okay, well, if you shoot a penalty-free match, you're going to have a good match. I, I, I don't think I saw anyone that didn't shoot penalties in this match. No, I'm serious. I think I had – I think I was the lowest person or the, lo the person with the lowest amount of penalties at 40 seconds. Yes. Yeah. Uh, looking at the, uh, practice score, that practice score here, uh, the winner of, of TAC ops had 55, the, yeah. the overall winner had 55 seconds of penalties. So yeah, it's, and scrolling down, uh, yeah, a couple people didn't have penalties that, but they didn't show up. So <laughs> <laughs> they never got there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so you, so that's kind of unusual, right? I mean, usually yes. you can shoot a penalty free match, but with with uh, the scoring, you know, it's uh, if you hit instead of hitting in the A zone, you hit the C zone. That's what a one and a half second penalty or something like that. Right, half second for C's and one and a half for a D. Yeah, there you go. Um, funny story. Uh, I drove eighteen hours straight to get to Kentucky the uh, the night before we were going to shoot. And uh, unfortunately, my timing didn't work out, and so I was exhausted the next morning and missed the first two stages. And I didn't get to my – or I, I didn't realize that the, t the targets were scored until my, like, second or third stage of the day where I, I saw someone walking by and counting. I'm like, wait, what's happening here? What's that guy doing? Yeah. One of, one of the girls, I think, on our second stage uh, was stage eight where there's some rifle paper right up close on each wing. And uh, right up close, they're probably 20 yards. But she went, it was Christy Connor Tate. She just went smoking through those. And we all looked at each other and was like, she forgot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you asked about logistics and check-in, scoring, and prize table. I mm -hmm. thought that they did a great job. One of the great things that a girl in a gun does is they're really good at logistics. So uh, pre-communication, um, they have a Facebook page. They really put out a lot of information, more so than any match that I think I've been to, or at least I pay attention to. Um, but they did, a, they did a great job. They are excellent at herding cats, I say. Yeah, they, they do a great job of that. They, uh, I mean, so for check-in for staff, right, they had like a bag for each person. And it wasn't like they had a whole pile of bags. They had a bag with every person's name on it, you know, so right. and everyone got like a, a name tag and makes the uh, the socializing easier, which is important to them, which is kind of cool. Right. Right. That's uh, they did a good job. All right. So let's uh, let's talk about the venue. Let's talk about uh, Rock Castle. Well, it's one of my favorite places on Earth. Um, this time of year is amazing because it's not like smoking hot with a hundred percent humidity. It was actually just perfect. Actually the entire <laughs> time we were, there was some threat of rain, but uh, that held off and we had an amazing, uh, yeah, I can't say enough about it. Uh, Thunder Valley was, um, good. They got new roads going into Thunder Valley and, um, well not into Thunder Valley, but you know, that main road that gets you to the, from the highway. Yeah. Um, the Thunder Valley that's been repaved and uh, just, you know, the hospitality at Thunder at um, Rock Castle is second to none. And we had a great time as usual. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah, we, we haven't talked about the after 
the after uh, party, have we? Yeah, we'll we'll get to that down in the uh, in the fun factor part of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked we talked about pre communication. They uh, they're good communicators. They uh, have a Facebook group. Any sort of emails that came out, um, round count stuff like that. Oh yeah, everything was. I I can't I can't I don't know what else we could have. They could have put out that would have made it um, better, honestly. And uh, I mean, take that with a grain of salt. I'm busy, so uh, I, I I'm basically about one step ahead of myself. And like today, I'm leaving for Oklahoma City, and as soon as I get done with this, and you know, I'll figure out where I'm staying after I leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm kind of that way too. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, let's talk about staff. How was the staff? Uh, I, uh, I think their staff is great. They are, like I said, this is their second year of doing this. So I have seen, I have seen a change from last year and I know that they're open to suggestions. So next year, I'm sure some of the things that we saw this year are going to be different. Um, but they, you know, they try really hard and I, I want to give people who who match do do any kind of matches, match director, match admin, staff. Mm-hmm. I want to always give them the benefit of the doubt because I don't want to go work. I want to go have fun. And these guys show up and they put in a lot of time. Some of them don't get paid. Um, okay, a lot of them don't get paid, and they're doing this out of the goodness of their heart. So whenever I have a a bitch, a gripe, a moan, a complaint. I try to um, do that, A, at the right moment, and B, um, with as much sugar as I possibly can because I want to help make things better. And this isn't just about this match. This is about any match. Mm -hmm. But there are things, there are growing pains that are going on with this match, and uh, I just have every confidence that they are going to listen to people and that they are going to make adjustments where – uh, they feel it's necessary and um, keep trying to provide the best experience they can for their women. They really love, they really love doing what they're doing and providing this for women. But you know, if you bitch and moan so much, I mean, I would say, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do it anymore. Adios. Yeah, set up your own match. Yeah. So I would I would give them a high grade when it came to their match and what they pulled off. Very good. All right. So what was uh what was the f- how was the fun factor? We call this uh we just call this the day factor, but we'll call this the die factor here. Oh, die had a die had a great time. Like we talked about in the opening, the um the energy was just you could just feel it it was different it's different than most matches there's a lot of and especially coming from me okay i'll give you a little insight to me i have always been a tomboy i had my best friend growing up was a guy and uh i've been in a profession a male dominated profession and hobby and things like that so and then i barrel raced so my experience around lots of women has not been positive Um, so for me to enjoy myself and really praise and say that this was a great experience is, is something to be said Mm -hmm. because I usually don't like to hang around with a bunch of women, but this particular, um, this particular event is, is just very refreshing. Everybody's, um, there to have a great time that, you know, the energy going up into it, you can see it on Facebook. I mean, they're constantly talking about it, talking about, uh, their gear and can't wait to see you and things like that. So it's a little different than most. And, and I appreciated it. The, the idea behind the schedule, the schedule and the matrix was to get everybody done by as soon as they could, uh, three, four o'clock. I think our last day was maybe four thirty, and we were a late squad, but they wanted to get everybody back to the lodge and have an experience and network and visit and and have a good time. So I, I felt like they accomplished that as well. Uh, very very high fun factor. Yeah. So that networking event, a, a wine and cheese party, which I've never experienced at a match before. I didn't realize that was supposed to be a networking party. I just saw wine and cheese. <laughs> 
I, I guess it's uh, whatever you want to make it, right? I was going to say every day at Rock Castle is a networking opportunity, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's amazing just like, you know, cruising around the parking lot, you know, walking from one end to the other, all of a sudden you're in an hour-long conversation. Right. Especially you, I bet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, <laughs> at Pro-Am it was like kind of difficult to get to my from my truck to the front door. Like, I know. <laughs> you can't be late and expect to not run into somebody if you have to run back in and get something and come back out. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. And then uh, one of the things, the funny thing that happened was uh, CBS, C- CBS Nightly News. So oh, yeah. this wasn't local news. This was the CBS News, the one that has employed Katie Couric in the past. So everybody uh, was very apprehensive about their presence, and uh, I was very proud of A Girl and a Gun and of Rock Castle for allowing them to come and talk to us and experience something with us. And I, uh, I think I saw the piece. Uh, I don't know if you can link it in the. Yeah in this, but, um, I thought it was fair. I mean, everybody is talking about the Las Vegas shooting. So everybody's obviously enamored with the, um, AR 15 and the platform. So I thought that, uh, it was better than I expected because I really expected to be, you know, a little blindsided or twisted. And I felt like they did a pretty decent job of, uh, at least allowing us to have a voice, uh, dissension. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it it was. Uh, I think I I've said that it's it was unusually fair, right? Right, right. And you know what? Um, one of the gentlemen that was there um, doing the filming, I I did. You may have seen the cameo. They they wanted to get somebody shooting mm-hmm. uh, fast, so I went up to the side match and I shot. Uh, I shot for them, and they put a camera on my gun and stuff like that. So they got some footage of that. Oh, you and sucker. You fell for that one. I, I did. <laughs> Shoot this real and fast. I, I was, I, and I actually <laughs> shot really well too. And I was like, well, maybe I should have slowed down those splits. <laughs> <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, uh, two, two of the three guys that were over with me, uh, asked to shoot my AR and, uh, I accommodated them of course. And, um, they were, they were concealed carry people out of Chicago. So they had Hmm. never shot an AR before, but they are gun guys. So, um, they weren't necessarily hostile. They understand that we are apprehensive about their presence there, uh, because obviously it's not, it's not secret what, what happens to us every once in a while. Yeah. And that we're getting beat up lately, but one of them called me after the, after the fact, and he said, "You know, I go a lot of places in the world, and I was really impressed with um, you. I was impressed with the group of people I was around that was genuine. Um, so we 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 can make a difference. It's just that we have to invite these people to the range or get them to be around us and have a discussion about." about guns and expose ourselves as gun owners and we're normal. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the difficult part, but I was very happy with their presence and hopefully, hopefully we at least converted three to thinking that gun owners are the greatest things on the face of the earth. Yeah. Yeah. That's a tough one, but I, uh, you know, I felt like it went, you know, from, from my perspective and watching the, just the news piece and, you know, hearing the apprehension from the people involved and, and then watching it like as a, as a media consumer, it went way better than I had expected. So hopefully it does, right. you know, at least show some fence, fence sitters out there that we're not all nuts. Well, and, and to our audience, uh, that was fly by the seat of your pants. So we didn't know that was coming until like the day of, there's Mm -hmm. no preparation. You're shooting a match. You get pulled, you know, you get pulled aside and they want to have something to say. Well, a, you want to have something to say, especially if you're going to get national, um, exposure out of it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, my, my point is that we as shooters, as we, as gun owners, as shooters, and especially as professional shooters that do this, 
um, on a regular basis, we have got to have something to say and practice the media, um, the media training and, you know, just turn a camera on yourself and have a conversation and you put yourself in, in the shoes of, of the girls who were on CBS. You know, what's the difference in a, why does somebody need an AR-15? If you can't answer that right now, it's, it's not going to be any easier when your neighbor asks you or the CBS nightly news asks you, Yeah, you need to under, you need to educate yourself and understand what your response is to that. So you can make a difference with whomever you have contact with. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's, it's just like, uh, like our perishable skills of shooting. It's something that you need to practice. Right. And, you know, your AR-15, just to touch on it, uh, your AR-15 is the most versatile weapon there is. And the two two three is not necessarily uh, a killing a killing round. It's a little bit bigger than a twenty two. And if you've ever talked to any of the military guys, they can't stand it. They, they it, you know, it doesn't kill effectively. <laughs> yeah. So you can change ammo. You can use it for uh, home defense. You can use it to go hunting, change ammo again. Uh, you can use it for sport. There's just so many different applications for the AR-15, which is why it's the America's most popular rifle. But that's the that's what you need to understand. Uh, your neighbors need to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think uh, it's it, you know it's the curse of knowledge. It's something that we always take for granted, right? We know all these right. these things about the uh, the platform and the uh, the ammunition and everything, but some people's only exposure to it is what they see on the news. And as we've seen with you know CNN showing a a normal stock as a bump stock with a grenade launcher on it and a How suppressor. How does that happen? How does that happen? <laughs> it's got to be like a concerted effort, you know. I mean, I mean, I would think that it was a concerted effort if I didn't watch like Transformers and they're talking about, you know, carbureted engines and they're clearly showing in the EFI motor, you know, <laughs> I think there's just, just stupid people out there that are playing in a sandbox they know nothing about. Yeah, but you would think that they would fact check and say like, let me go, you know, find somebody who knows what a bump stock is. You would think, <laughs> you would think, well, you, you worked in a, in an environment with a, a lot of, a lot of people, you know, before. And was everyone that you worked with competent? No. Yeah. See? <laughs> no. no. So overall, back to the match. Uh, sorry to get sidetracked. That's right. Um, but back to the match, I would give it very high rating. Um, I definitely plan on returning. I, I just hated to leave. Uh, we had, uh, squ you know, squads that gelled. Um, you know, and I was thinking about it, we gel so much that I had probably at least 50% of the women that I had on my squad last year. And I'm wondering if we shouldn't just bust up our squads. Like if you've been on a squad before, go, go to somewhere else, because I don't want it to be just, I know 10 women or no 15 women. I would like to get to know everybody. So mm -hmm. I'll talk to Juliana and Robin about that next year. See if we can't shake some stuff up. Yeah, you know, that's a good point. Like, I, I really enjoy shooting with uh, friends and people I know and stuff like that. But I definitely learn a lot when I shoot with uh, other people, people I don't know. Plus, it's great, you know, always great to make new friends. Well, that that is the curse because it's uh, that's how you meet new people. Um, but on the other hand, boy, has that bit me in the butt. I mean, we like to shoot with our friends and our buddies because we know that our friends and our buddies reset and we know that we don't have to wait, you know, yeah. there's some downfall that if you get on a squad that they don't reset, that's probably the biggest, uh, the biggest downfall of shooting with people that you don't know. So if you're listening to this, that's your other lesson is to reset and work hard because your squad mates are paying attention. Yeah. You know, that, that's a good point, Di. And another thing that I'm so glad you brought that up. Another thing I heard from ROs is that the uh, concept of a squad bomb is something that they really enjoyed. And for people that weren't at the match, squad bomb was like a designated person. And there was some squad dads too that yep. were, um, they were there to keep shooters in order to make sure shooters were ready when they were called and to encourage people kindly to reset when they were slacking off a bit. And right. the ROs mentioned that it made their job so much easier. 
Right. And um, two things on that. First of all, last year uh, we had pros and we didn't have any squad moms. We just had pros at the head of each one, which put a lot of pressure on uh, those of us that volunteered to do that. Um, trying to get everybody, make sure everybody was ready, got their stuff, they knew their plan, um, things like that. So that took a lot of pressure off of us. I could just show up and, uh, you know, if I had something to offer, I don't mind giving it to you, but I had Aaron Hayes as my squad mom, squad dad. And it, it's just nice to know that somebody else has the reins and mm -hmm. that I can just, I, I can just show up and play. Right. Um, Let's see. I said I had two things and I did at the time, but I have to spit those things out while I'm actually thinking about them because <laughs> I forget them. Well, so the, so we were, go so ahead. The pro It'll on, come back later. <laughs> the pro on the squad. So what was your role as the pro on the squad other than to shoot and demonstrate cut out. shooting? What was your role as the pro on the squad other than just shooting? You know, it was a reduced capacity. Um, I They could see me shoot. Uh, they could see, you know, kind of, hey, they could pick something up uh, when it comes to just stage, stage plan. I shared my stage plan with everybody, so it wasn't like that was a secret. But they could actually see me execute the plan, maybe how it should have been, you know, how the – it's just kind of an example. So having a pro on there is good. Having squad moms are good. Uh, oh, I was going to tell you this. I told you to come back to me. Grand Island does at the um, Hornady match. They have something similar, and they call it a Wrangler. Yeah. So they basically um, have your your order, your shooting order, and they kind of herd everybody. So I like that. I don't know if it's feasible to do that at more matches. I know that's even more staff. But that, that really does help because especially here's what happens in a match that I go to with my people and my friends is that every nobody really takes the reins and it always ends up, if I don't do it, then it'll end up in my hands at the last minute. So I just <laughs> take it from the beginning and I set a shooting order. I establish the shooting order, make sure everybody's good with it. And then, then we run with that. But every time you walk up to a stage, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon somebody to give them the shooting order. So, um, that's another way that I, that another reason that I like the Wrangler or the things, because when I walk up to a stage, then I can preload my shotgun and I can start thinking about my plan as opposed to writing down everybody's name again. That's my two cents. <laughs> well, I like it. Yeah. So that is a, that is a tough one because then you're adding. So if you have like, what do we usually have? Like 10 squads or something like that for, for a match, 10, 12. So if you, if you do that, then you're adding another 12 staff. I mean, that's, right. it makes sense that the Hornady match, because from what I understand from people that have been at it, it's Hornady employees that are volunteering, right. To, to be Wranglers. I don't, I didn't know that for sure. Okay. We'll call that an unfounded rumor. Allegedly, okay. <laughs> allegedly, like, it's Hornady staff. Right. But uh, I guess maybe the uh, the takeaway there for people that um, are shooting is uh, step up and help your her yourself, yourself, your squad, and uh, all the arrows out. Right. Or if you've got a, a loved one, a husband, a wife, a mom or dad that's around and doesn't mind doing that, then they, you know, heck. I can't just go somewhere and, and watch something. I have, you know, it's always more fun for me if I jump in and actually work. So if that's the responsibility that I have, just uh, making sure that the list gets there, that's, that helps the squad and it's easy. Yep, definitely. Well, Di, is there anything else that you uh, want to add to your match recon of A Girl and a Gun Fall Festival? You know, I think we've covered everything. We've been chatting about it for like an hour. So I hope everybody uh, appreciates what you're doing and tunes in. Well, thanks, Di. I appreciate that. So thanks for being a part of the uh, the Match Recon. This is, uh, as always, something that we like to do after matches to give people an idea of what to expect if they're going to be shooting this match next year. And I appreciate your unique perspective as uh, a female because I could not speak about a girl in a gun match. <laughs> Well, you can, and I'll tell you this, that um, Mike Tate, Christy Connor Tate's husband was there, Aaron Hayes was there, and there were several other husbands there. Heath uh, Clevenger was an RO, mm -hmm. but uh, I was with Aaron the entire week, and he probably fixed 
20 guns, no less than 20 guns. Mike Tate was keeping, keeping count. Yeah. And he, he was several times during the match. He's like, I'm just having such a great time. And I was like, told Ryan about it. And I said, you've got to come next year because Aaron just has a blast. And Mike Tate was having a blast and that energy that we were talking about. I think everybody sees it and feels it. So, uh, you know, bring your husbands and we'll have, you know, hubbies can, um, they can have their own little bourbon and cigar <laughs> and we're doing our wine and cheese, I guess. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, I, I'd love to uh, be a part of it next year. Looking forward to that. I, I've, this is probably like the, so Aaron Hayes has a really good demeanor, right? He's a super happy person. This is probably the happiest I've ever seen him after a match. Like he, he definitely did have the, uh, the great time that he was talking about. So good. And I hope you did too. I did. I did. Absolutely. Well, All right. We appreciate you coming. Thanks. Yeah. And I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to share it with the audience. I think it's a pretty cool concept and, uh, it's good to, uh, good to experience it firsthand. And for all you listening, before you take off, make sure you check out the show notes at threegunshow.com for links to things that we discussed in the podcast, including the, uh, the news featurette that, uh, that Di was on. Hey, before you take off, be sure to check out the show notes at threegunshow.com for links to things that we discussed in the podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Armalite, the original. Armalite rifles put the AR in AR-15. The rifles themselves come with 1 and 8 twist barrels, match barrels 18 inch or 13 and a half inch with a 15 uh, inch or 12 and a half inch handguard. Timney trigger, Luth AR stock, adjustable uh, gas system, tunable comp, a patented tunable comp. This thing's ready to go right out of the box for a three gun with no additional modifications other than putting on a nice optic. I myself, Use a Vortex Viper PST 1 to 6 when I'm shooting Tac Ops or their Spitfire when I'm shooting Limited. Check them out at Armalite.com. A quick reminder that if you enjoyed this podcast, consider supporting the show on Patreon for as little as $5 per month. That's like three rounds of 9mm per episode. Patreon.com slash 3 Show. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Unload show clear.